Um, well, this place packed out. Welcome, everybody. Let's get this show on the road. We're starting a little bit late, but I think I heard that everyone was still in the auditorium until a few minutes ago. So, uh, we'll. Um, you're in luck because I talk fast. We've got 45 minutes or less now to go through talk on Mormonism. So. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Adrian Toder. I am a member uh, of the Ambassadors Forum. Uh, we've been uh, teaching various uh, apologetics uh, uh, breakouts in this session and actually in previous years as well. And just a quick show of hands real quick. Uh, th this is a um, question in terms of uh, interactions with Mormonism. You guys obviously know the, the, the talk. I'm curious if, you got, if he, people here have friends that are Mormons or uh, neighbors or relatives, just raise your hand if you've interacted in the past. Okay, so about half more. Okay. Um, I want to tell you the story of how I got into this topic. Um, I've always been interested in, in my, my own faith. I grew up in a Christian household. Um, and uh, I am married. I have kids. I, I look very much like a Mormon in a certain sense. And in fact, one day I was at home with my wife and kids. She was prepping uh, dinner, and there's a knock on the door. And I open the door, and sh sure enough, at the door, there are two uh, Mormon missionaries, Elder Smith and Elder Egan. Very nice-looking young men. And they asked me, Have, do you mind if we, 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 we can share with you our faith? Um, in, uh, we were from the Ch Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we'd like to share our faith with you. And now my wife knows me. She knows I enjoy these conversations. And she's in the middle of cooking. And I've got four kids running around the house. And I look back at her. And she has this like, okay, fine. <laughs> I say, hey, we're just about to sit for, down for dinner. Would you like to join us? They're excited. They come on in. And we have dinner together. And when dinner's over, like I said, these two young men were everything that I'd want my kids to be. Respectful, wonderful young men who, were, who knew how to, how to present their faith, were obviously very genuine in their faith. They wanted the best for me, and the best for me, according to them, was to come to faith, to their faith. We sat and we, we listened to, to, their, to their talk. In fact, I said nothing, but I listened, and I asked questions a little bit here and there, and at the end of our time, they said, thank you very much, and they asked, can we come back again next week? I said, absolutely. Next week, knock on the door, we had dinner again, we, we, we talked. I spent about four weeks while they presented their faith, and um, I knew, I actually knew, knew ahead of time, I, I had studied in the past about Mormonism. At the end of those four weeks, one of them finally turns to me and says, well, we've been talking about this this whole time. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about this, and, and do you feel like you'd want, like to come to our church? I've been waiting for this moment, because... I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to beat somebody over the head with my ideas. I don't want to come in and just come in guns a-blazing about my, my, my thoughts. I want this to be a calm discussion. And I don't want them to feel like they're being attacked. I said, listen, I'm glad you asked. And I said, here are my thoughts. And I gave him, I gave both of them my thoughts and my challenges. At the end of my challenges, their eyes were like this. And you could... I could sense that they had never heard these challenges before. And they said, wow, that's a lot to think about. And I said, that is. I said, I don't want you to give me an answer right now, because obviously you've never heard some of these challenges, and maybe I'm lying, maybe I'm making this stuff up. But why don't you go home and think about it, and then maybe do your own research and see if I'm right. And they said, you know what? Do you mind if we bring one of our elders next week to have a discussion? Because they, they wanted a little backup, and I said, absolutely. Feel free. So next week, there's a knock on my door. Now there are three people at my door. And this is fantastic, because he says, I understand you had some challenges, and I'd like to hear them. So now I got to give my, share my faith and my challenges to their faith the second time. Now, the second, these first two young men were hearing it for the second time. The elder was a little bit older. He's maybe about my age. And now he, at the end of my, my challenge, his eyes are this big, and he goes, that is really fascinating. Do you mind if I bring somebody else next week? <laughs> so next week, there's a knock on my door. Now I've got four people at my door. We welcome 
it's getting very expensive to feed the local Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we have the same discussion. And now, this, now, again, these two young men who had been here the first time heard it for the third time. And each time, there was a look of desperation in their eyes as they look over to their elders as they are hoping and praying for answers to what I'm, what I'm saying. And it never comes. And the answers to the, to the challenges never come. When they... What I want to talk about today is what those challenges were and how I had that discussion. Because when they left, they told me this. They said two things. First off, they thanked me for the fact that we had these wonderful civil discussions. We had fed them. We had welcomed them to our home. It wasn't, it, we weren't fighting. And they said, you gave us a lot to think about. This was maybe about 10 years ago. To this day, I get emails from Elder Egan, who emails me two or three times a year. Merry Christmas. He's, he is, you know, married now. He has his own kids. And he continually reminds me how much that has continued to challenge him. And I pray that he finds his way to faith because the challenges are real. And I want to today share with you what the challenges are. And I didn't make nearly enough copies, but I, for those of you who want them, I'm going to have my notes on hard copy because what I did, I'll tell you the secret. I didn't memorize this stuff. I had to print out stuck it under the couch, and every time they showed up, I would kind of take a peek at it, because I don't remember this stuff. So I want to share with you, and you're welcome to take those handouts at the end of this. It's going to have all of the, 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 the challenges that I'm about to present, and if you have friends, if you have someone, a knock on the door, it'll be a great way to have this interaction. Now, there are two ways to, um, to start the discussion with, uh, about Mormonism with somebody who's uh, uh, there's one's the theological aspect, and this is super important. This one is the fact that the Mormon church believes different things than, than traditional Christianity. And there's a lot of theological stuff that's very different, and you could show them where they differ from the Bible, and that's super important. In fact, if you learn that side of things, you'll get to, uh, this is super great, because you'll get to start studying about the Trinity, about these, these foundational concepts that the that the Bible teaches, and you have to become an expert in them. And I'll tell you what, that's super hard. And I'm lazy. <laughs> so there's a second aspect to this that is a lot easier, and it challenges ways that, that are so, in my opinion, simple, clear, and anybody who has a calm, rational discussion about these issues can't help but come away with the same sort of impression that these young men had, and as they're in trouble. <laughs> So here's the only, when they asked me, what do you think about this? I said, the entire question relies on this one premise, one question. Was Joseph Smith reliable? Now, for those of you who don't know who Joseph Smith was, who haven't discussed Mormonism in the past or so on, let me give you a quick, um, quick summary of Joseph Smith. This is Joseph Smith. He was a, he's the founder of Mormonism. So for those of you that have friends that are Mormons, they all very much admire Joseph Smith. He was a, um, he grew up in, his story is this, he grew up in, in, in New York in the early 19th century, and he says that while he was growing up, he prayed to God for which church should he join? And he says that God revealed himself and said, don't join any church, they're all corrupt. And later it says, he says that an angel appeared to him and showed him the, the, the location of a hidden uh, uh, set of, ta uh, of, of golden, uh, um, uh, this is basically a golden plates of this book that was the uh, answer to his questions. It was, he was going to reestablish the church as, was, as it should have been. And so over the next few years, he took those plates and he translated them into what was now called the Book of Mormon. And he gathered followers and he basically started this whole thing. And the, the, the Book of Mormon is basically, actually, quick question, has anyone ever read through the Book of Mormon? Yeah, a couple of you? Okay, okay. It reads a lot like the Bible in some sense. In fact, there are whole chunks taken right out of the Bible. But what, what it is, is the, it is, his, it is the story of a group of Jews that escaped. It's basically the story of where the Native Americans came from. So his version is that there were uh, uh, Jews that escaped Israel back uh, during the time of... Um, 
the Babylonian captivity right before uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in, they escaped, they started this whole civilization here. There were wars and, and stuff that happened and eventually Jesus himself shows up in the new world and preaches uh, uh, salvation to them. And, but, there's, but eventually the, the bad tribes overcome the, the good tribes and what's left is, for, uh, is the Native Americans that were in America at the time of the, again, early 1800s. It's interesting because this was a question that people had back then. They wondered who, they had discovered this new world and there were people here. And they're like, who are these people? Where do they come from? And the Book of Mormon explains where he, you know, where, where they felt like those people came from. Um, so the Book of Mormon also includes, it's not just the Book of Mormon. If you ever see their, their Bible, it's like that thick because there's the Bible. They believe in the Bible. They, they have the Book of Mormon and they have the Pearl of which is a few more books, and then the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a few more. There's all these extra things added to it. And so uh, that's what the Book of Mormon is. And it's, again, there's, there's, it reads very much like old King James Bible uh, about, about the story. Joseph Smith made certain claims. And I told my friends, these, these missionaries, if he was right, I will bring my entire family to your church Sunday morning because I want to be, I want to be in, in the right church, right? I mean, who wouldn't want to, if you discovered that, that their, theirs is the right way and your way is the wrong way, who wouldn't drop what they've got and go over there? And they were excited to hear that because I, that's what I want. And I said, but if he was wrong, would you consider dropping what you have in order to come to what you, what, you've what, you, what you discover to be the right church. At this point, they have to say yes, because I just told them I would, and it would be unfair if they said no. I said, great, let's figure out Joseph Smith. Was he, was he uh, accurate? Because the Bible warns us. As in 1 John, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they, they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Joseph Smith claimed to be a prophet, the question is, was he a real prophet? So, let's start asking a few basic questions. Um, there, the, um, I explained to them this. When we look at the Bible, there is a series of stories that happen. You read about David and Goliath, and you read about the Canaanites, and you read about uh, uh, the Battle of Jericho, and you read about uh, all these kings and so on. You guys have read through the Bible, and you've, you've encountered these things. What's amazing about the Bible is that because it's true, when you dig in the ground, you find evidence of those accounts. In fact, this is what's so cool about this. Um, it, 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 in, in studying this, it really built my faith because... I have this sense that I, I had all these like, um, I don't know, Sunday school stories and they were so nice to hear and it was about, you know, various people who did these things and it was great and it was so, wonderful. and then all of a sudden you read in the newspaper, uh, 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 the guy's digging in, in, in Israel and he finds something that references some battle that happened and you're like, that battle was in the Bible and it wasn't like just some story that was really nice to hear in in. Sunday school, some guy just dug up the evidence for it. Boom, it's like, whoa, this suddenly made it seem so much more real to me. In fact, this is what's so cool about um, uh, the Bible. Here's an article from uh, the Times of Israel where a researcher looked through all the archaeological evidence we have currently, and he said, right now we're able to show direct evidence of 53 different characters from the Bible, 53 which is crazy because some of these stories are of kings, but some are of like nobodies, right? And so you end up with these, these various artifacts. In fact, the Bible does more than just uh, 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 tell you stories of what's, what we already know that we've been, managed to dig up. It tells us things that we didn't even know about outside of the Bible. Great example, there was this group of uh, 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 people in the Bible called the Hittites. They're referenced a bunch of times, and for a long time, there was zero evidence of the Hittites. In fact, this whole, imagine a whole group of people where nobody had any writings from the Hittites, no 
no digs, no, nothing, nothing. And so for the long time, people said, well, this is probably kind of made up. It worked in the story really nice, this group of people. And then, sure enough, somebody digs up evidence for the Hittites. And, and, and what was crazy is the Bible had been saying it all along, but nobody believed it because, hey, it's the Bible, it's a bunch of you know, fairy tales and so on. And then, boom, there it is. There's the Hittites. And they figure out this whole civilization that existed whose only record happened to be in the Bible. Time and time again, this, is, this occurs. We've got evidence for King David. We've got evidence for King Hezekiah. Hezekiah, fascinating story. This was in the last like 10 years. They found his signet ring. So like where he would like stamp you know, his approval on a particular seal of something. They found that ring from Hezekiah from 30, uh, 2,500 years ago. It's just crazy. Um, we've got, uh, you got this idea, and this is what I'm explaining to my, to my, um, uh, my Mormon friends, I said, this is, this is what's cool about the Bible. And, and, and they're like, yeah, this is awesome, because they believe in the Bible as well. Because the Bible is true, we're able to confirm it, or at least show that, hey, it wasn't made up, this, you know, the, the, the basic ideas. We see evidence for various things. How about the Book of Mormon? Well, there's one problem with the Book of Mormon, and that is it's completely made up. And there are zero evidences when it comes to archaeology. And my, my, my one of my friends are like, oh, really? No, come on. I said, look, archaeologists have been digging in North America for how long here now? And of the various, in the Book of Mormon describes peoples and tribes and battles and various events that happened in different areas and so on, cities, entire civilizations, and not a single item has ever been recovered that gives any sort of evidence for anything in the Book of Mormon. In fact, the Smithsonian talks about this. Um, it says, um, the Smithsonian writes, um, the Smithsonian Institute has never used the Book of Mormon in any way as a scientific guide since Smithsonian archaeologists see no direct connection between the archaeology of the New World and the subject matter of that book, of the book. And I said, this is not because Smithsonian is anti-Mormon. Because a lot of times they'll feel like people are out to get them and they're like, ah, they just don't like Mormons and so on. Well, the Smithsonian is very happy, or not happy, but like at least uh, uh, very willing to show that there's plenty of archaeological evidence for various accounts in the Bible. So what are they, anti-Mormon but pro-Christian? How, how does that work for them? The fact is, no, this is just people digging in the ground and they realize that there's no connection between these massive stories that, more, that uh, Joseph Smith wrote about in the New World. None at all. It's fascinating because um, there's, uh, because we know quite a bit now about what happened in the New World before Columbus showed up, and none of it matches up to what Joseph Smith said. Now, in fact, he couldn't have known because back when Joseph Smith was writing the Book of Mormon, nobody knew what was going on before Columbus arrived. Nobody knew. There hadn't been any sort of historical accounts of it. There was, n there was simply no understanding. And so there was no way to check him. On so when he wrote the Book of Mormon, or translated it, as he says, everyone's like, okay, I guess that, that might have been what happened, but we have no evidence to the contrary. Now we do, and as we see it, it doesn't line up at all. So that's the first problem. The next problem is something called anachronisms. Anyone know what this movie is? Okay, okay, some people, maybe the older folks in this room. One of my favorite movies, Braveheart. Uh, in Braveheart, he, he wears, so this is, a, a, this is about a, a Scottish warrior who, who fought, and, and he's wearing a kilt. Now, in the movie, he's wearing a kilt. The problem is, as cool as the kilt is, the problem is the time in the histor it's, 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 a, it's a historical movie about a real guy named William Wallace. When he lived, kilts were not around. So the movie shows him in a kilt, but the reality was that kilts weren't around until like three or four hundred years after him, and that was, but it was a movie, and so it looked kind of cool. How do you not put a Scottish guy in a kilt? Come on. Uh, and so this, this is called an anachronism. Anachronism is something that is in a period of time that doesn't belong in that, it's shown as, a, as belonging in that period of time when it really doesn't. It's like if you throw a car into the middle of, of that battle in Scotland in you know, 1500, it wouldn't make sense, right? The car doesn't belong in that era. 
It would be an anachronism. So it was a kilt. Joseph Smith talked about this new world, about the, the, the American Indians before Columbus showed up. Nobody really knew what, the, what things were like before Columbus showed up, and he didn't either. As a result, if he were completely making up this story, what would you expect to see? A lot of anachronisms, right? So if you weren't around and you, and, and, and you, 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 ha you were not there, you would expect him to maybe add a few things that didn't really belong there. If he was a real prophet, you wouldn't see anachronisms because this would be a real thing from God and God doesn't put cars in the middle of a battle, right? The problem was that uh, he, uh, uh, is that the Book of Mormon contains tons of anachronisms, things that do not belong in the period of time that he wrote about. Examples. He wrote about various animals that were actually brought over by Europeans. So again, the Book of Mormon is an account of the New World before Columbus showed up, before any Europeans arrived, right? Europeans brought horses. There were no horses in, 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 in North America during the time that he wrote about. Now, he didn't know that, and so he threw them into the story. Oops, they don't belong there. He talks about elephants. There were no elephants in North America during that time. He talks about cows, goats, pigs, all animals that do not belong in that time frame. It gets worse. He talks about, <laughs> he talks about chariots in these battles. Now, if you know anything about, North, about the New World, there were no wheeled devices. The wheel was not around before Columbus showed up in North America. But he talks about chariots. Chariots don't belong there. He talks about metal swords. There were no metal swords. He talks about... Not just metal swords, you know, he talks about scimitars. This was weird. The scimitars are those curved like Arabic swords. Totally don't belong in this, in this period of time. He talks about silk. There was no silk in, in North America before the Europeans arrived. He talks about the compass. The compass wasn't even invented anywhere in the world at the time at which he writes about it. He talks about glass windows. In the, in like, the, you know, the 500 AD uh, uh, coins. And this is a fascinating one. There were two groups of people, uh, the Nephites, actually, more importantly, there, there was the Nephites that the Book of Mormon talks about, and the Nephites had coins. There's a whole verse that talks about the Nephite coins, and he names them. So again, this is the, it's so fascinating how he went into specifics. There's a verse in the Book of Mormon, it says, and these were the coins of the Nephites, and he, it was this particular one that's named this and this one, and it sounds so real. Sounds so real, because it gives you the different kinds of coins. Now, this is, I, when I was talking to them, I explained to them, because the Bible is real and it's true, when it describes coins, you can actually find these coins. You guys know the story of the widow and, and the widow's mite? Remember in the New Testament, Jesus goes, is at the temple, and he says, he points to a widow who gave her last two mites. These are coins called a mite. And they, he says that woman gave more than all the rest of them because he gave, she gave her last two pennies, her last two mites. I, I opened up my phone for, for my friends here, and I said, typed in eBay, widow's mite. I can f there are so many of these that we find, these coins, that are referenced in the Bible. You can get it for like 15 bucks. They're from 2,000 years ago. There are Roman coins that are available now. You can just go get them anywhere because they've dug up so many of these darn things. They're everywhere. I showed them. Uh, sorry, I said, uh, 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 widow's might, because the Bible is true. We find them. I showed them the verse in the Book of Mormon. I said, here's the Nephite coins that you, the Book of Mormon references. Let's type in Nephite coins into eBay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops, they don't exist. They don't exist because there were no coins back then. But he didn't know that. And so I said, if you were looking at it objectively and you were looking from the outside and you ask yourself, what would somebody making up a story do? It would look more like this. What would a prophet or someone who's actually writing an account that is real look like? It would look more like that, where you can find the things. 
The next problem. The problems go deeper. The Book of Mormon is a story of how the American Indians, the, the Native Americans who were here before Columbus, it says that they were ancestors of a Jewish group that sailed over. Now, back in Joseph Smith's time, you couldn't check that. The problem for Joseph Smith is that you can check that now, right? You guys ever do those 23andMe or those DNA tests to figure out where you're from and so on? You can, you can, you can spit on this little thing and you send it in to the to a company and they'll tell you, they can, from my spit, they can tell me where I'm from. It's crazy. Now you can do that with American, with Native Americans. And if you get a Native American and you say, spit on this thing, you send it in and you track the DNA, you can check. Are Native Americans ancestors of Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli people from, you know, 1500 or, or 2,500 years ago? Eh, they're not. We know that their, their ancestors were from Siberia of how many thousands of years ago. That's what, the, that's what the Native Americans are related to, not Israelis, not Jews that escaped from that long ago. So once again, you've got a situation where Joseph Smith made a claim. He made a claim that said, this is where they're from, and it turns out not true, because we can check it now. Back then, nobody knew, and nobody could check it. Now we can, and we've discovered this is a problem. And I, again, I, I would interrupt my, my talk with my, my friends here. I'd say, I promise you, I'm not trying to attack you. What I'm trying to do is ask the question, is Joseph Smith reliable? Because remember, this is important. I'm not saying this because I want to make fun of you. I'm not saying this because I want you to feel embarrassed. None of this applies. I'm saying that we're... We're, all of us are in danger of believing the wrong thing or being deceived. The Bible warns us over and over and over again, do not be deceived. And if you're deceived, this is what deceiving looks like. Could it, is it possible that he had it wrong? It gets worse. This to me was, the, was the, like the left hook that just ended the whole discussion for me. It's called the Book of Abraham. If you open up the Book of Mormon, I told you it's about that thick. One of the books in there is called the Book of Abraham. Now, this is a translation of a papyri that was brought to Joseph Smith when he was around. Joseph Smith had his followers. They were all... He, one day, a guy shows up in the town, and he's got this mummy from Egypt. And along with the mummy, he has some scrolls. And back then, nobody could read them. Right? So, so if you guys remember from history, there's the uh, Rosetta Stone that was discovered that helped them decipher these. The, the, it was just being discovered. They were just starting to figure this out. But, where he was, nobody could read these things. But they had heard that there was this guy in town who had abilities to translate. Like, hey, bring it to this guy. So they brought it to Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith said, I can read this. And he said, in fact, one of these is actually a writing of Abraham from the Old Testament. And he translates it and calls it the Book of Abraham. It was then put as a fifth scripture for them and has been there ever since. You can grab any Book of Mormon, you know, uh, and one of the books in there is the Book of Abraham. The crazy thing is, like all problems with Mormonism, at the time, you couldn't check it. As the time people discovered, like I said, discovered the Rosetta Stone, they started being able to read it, and a lot of uh, uh, Egypt, e Egyptologists who knew how to read this now were looking at his, his translation saying, I don't think that's right. But the problem was the document, Appeared. They thought it was, it was burned up in the Great Chicago Fire, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, we don't have this thing anymore. 1960 rolls around, and this is crazy. 1960 rolls around, and somebody finds the actual papyri in some museum, and now all of a sudden the Mormon world is breathless. They're like, oh, we can finally prove to the world that Joseph Smith had it right all along. They take their papyri, they bring it to the best Egyptologists in the world. They say, please translate this. And they look at it, and they said, and they're like, is this the book of Abraham? And they said, no, <laughs> no, this is just some funeral text. It's some, it's some uh, you know, when you go in, it's called the book of breathings. Uh, it's, 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 it's what the, this person who dies is going to be like in the afterlife and all those things. It's a funeral text. It has nothing to do with Abraham or anything to do with what Joseph Smith translated. Another crash for, for poor, poor Joseph Smith. That was, yeah, go ahead. What did they say about that? Like, what did the Mormon church in general say about that? 
one of the things I, I, I did when I f first started doing my research is going to, uh, to Mormon apologetics. So I, I, as, a, as a Christian apologist, I love defending my faith because I think it's, it's the more I learn about it, the more I, I, I come to the conclusion that, boy, this is just... When you look at Mormon apologetics, again, God bless them, they're some of my best friends, it's laughable. How, how do you defend this, right? How do you defend this? And I'll tell you what they say. There's two answers. One of them is maybe they didn't find the right one, even though Joseph Smith literally drew this into the book of Abraham. He drew this exact one. And the second one was there was a spiritual meaning underneath the actual meaning of the text that wasn't what was saying. So Joseph Smith wasn't translating the actual document. He was translating the spiritual meaning behind it that was invisible to the readers. Like, ah, oh, that's, that's, that's on the Mormon website. So there's a whole website. Uh, the, uh, uh, oh, boy, it's called, uh, and I'm, I'm losing it right now, but there's a, there's a Latter-day Saints apologetics website you can go to, and they'll have all these things, and they're very honest about the problem. This is a problem. They, they reference it correctly, and then they give you this answer, and it's like, really? This is, what, this is it? Um, this happened over and over again to poor Joseph Smith. Uh, Kinderhook plates, oh, we're running out of time. How much time do we have? 4.30? Oh, boy. Okay, we've got about, about 10 minutes or so. Kinderhook plates, uh, you can look this one up yourself. Same thing. He was, a guy forged these plates and said these are real. Joseph Smith thought they were real. Uh, they weren't. Um, here's the problem. Why would Joseph Smith lie? And this is where I went to my, to my friends. And why would he lie? I said, common uh, reasons for lying are greed, power, and lust. This is the three big issues people have. And this is, every lie or crime is, comes down to one of these three things. And the fact is, now that we know that Joseph Smith was not telling the truth, I think we can point to all three of these as causes that, he, that would cause him to lie. Now, this is a hard pill for them to swallow because Mormons have learned that Joseph Smith is a, is a bit of a saint. It's like telling you that Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, was a horrible person and lied. You're like, you feel kind of bad even hearing that, but this is the unfortunate truth. Jo First one was lust. Joseph Smith had over 30 wives. He had over 30 wives during his time. And as a, as a leader, this is, the, the, this is kind of an eye chart here, but this, these are the, the different wives he had and their ages when he married them. Some of you are already looking, and if you look closely right over there, there's a 14-year-old girl. Okay, do you know what he told her in order to marry her? He told her that her salvation depended on marrying him. That girl was told that her, the salvation of entire family was dependent on marrying Joseph Smith. So Joseph Smith, and not only that, some like a dozen of these women were already married at the time when he married them. Um, the fact is that lust was, so he... Uh, uh, married, his first wife, his name was Emma. He was with her his whole life, but he, but at some point he was, some point he was caught in a barn with somebody who was not a wife. And he basically said, oh, by the way, I got a revelation from God. Polygamy's cool again. And that's why I'm in this barn with this woman who's not my wife. And so then all of a sudden God is now uh, speaking through him that polygamy's great. And so, do, 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 all, all the way through his life, he had, you know, wife after wife. Power. Yeah. Does that mean all Mormons believe polygamy is okay because of that? Mormons uh, believe that polygamy was okay and now is no longer okay. So when, when, you talk to them, when you talk to them, they'll say, it was okay back then because we needed to establish our church. And just like it was in the Old Testament, there was a time and place for that. And they'll say that was past, and we've had new revelations that say it's not okay now. So there are some sects that would say that it's okay, but for the most part, your Mormon neighbor will not say it's okay. Yeah? Didn't the Mormon church break into two? The one that's still a cult, and the ones that are just kind of normal, and the cult still believes in polygamy, and the other one doesn't. Right. There, there, are, there are some, there's like more than just two. There's a few break-off fa factions. The point is, this doesn't apply to your typical Mormon neighbor. He would not say, uh, I can have 12 wives or 30 wives. But, he, but they do know that Joseph Smith had lots of wives, and they say that was okay back then because that was, that's what God revealed. Yeah? Has anybody ever thought that maybe it was a higher power that was more than just an emotional lust or 
uh, there was a higher power like Satan. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's very possible. Um, okay, we'll, we'll go quickly through this. Power, he had a lot of power in his life. He, he in fact, was going to run for president of the United States uh, at one point. He had a followers. He had plenty of money. His, his uh, supporters uh, basically supported him financially. He had all the typical motivations to lie that anybody else does. He was just some dude, and he was lying. That's what I explained to, to, to my friends. I said, it's, it's not unusual for someone to lie for these reasons, and he had all those reasons. You compare that to the apostles who did not have those same motivations. The apostles of the New Testament, they did not have money, they did not have women, and they did not have power. All those motivations are absent from the, from the New Testament uh, authors. And that's another reason to, 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 to see the difference between what the Bible says and what the Book of Mormon says. The motivations were not there for these guys. End of the discussion. How did this discussion go? At the end of that time, I asked them, does what I'm saying make sense? Now, that all four of these guys were in the room now, right? And I said, does this make sense? This is why I would reject Joseph Smith as a prophet. There's a lot of theological issues. There's a lot of stuff where it contradicts the Bible, and I would never accept that. And so, but, th but this is why. This is why I would not accept it. Now, how about you? Does this, I asked him, does this in any way make you rethink your faith? Does anybody who's interacted with Mormons know what they told me? They prayed about it. The, re the way they knew that, th that the Book of Mormon is true is because they prayed about it and they felt a burning in their bosom, they call it, that God was telling them it was true. Despite all of the mountains of issues, despite everything that you, I showed them, the fact that they prayed about it and they had this burning in the bosom, in fact, th told them it was true. In fact, they said, why don't you pray about it? Maybe you'll get the same burning in the bosom. I said, I refuse to pray about it. For the same reason I refuse to pray about things I already know are wrong. If I saw a woman walking down the street who was attractive and I'm married, would I say, God, should I go after that woman? I'm not going to pray about that. I already know what's wrong. That burning in the bosom might be the breakfast burrito I ate. I don't know what it was for you. But the fact is that we know through our intellect that this is not true for very obvious reasons. They, what was incredible was n there was no offense in this whole conversation. The whole time, it was very friendly, even though I, I was, was trying to take out their entire faith. My hope is that because they are people made in the image of God who have a brain and an intellect and so on, that they go back and they think about these things and they come to true faith in Jesus. In the meantime, what I want to do is we're going to maybe one more minute here and we'll, we'll wrap things up. This is why I love apologetics. This is why I love Christianity. This is why I love God. God has not left us with this kind of faith. The Mormon faith is, is so, it's on such shaky ground. Christianity is not on that shaky ground. It is fantastic. It is so great to have this bedrock of faith that can sit on, on, on reality so that I'm not afraid to enter these conversations with anybody because what we have is the real deal. We don't have to come up with weird answers to these questions about how maybe there's multiple layers of meaning and these, none of that stuff. Why? Because Christianity is true, and that's fantastic. The more you do this research, the more you, look, you study it up, the, the, the comparison of Mormon archaeology versus Christian archaeology, theology, the Bible, all these things, you'll come to a deeper faith. It's fantastic. And for your Mormon friends, these conversations are tough. But you do it with love, you do it with, with respect, and you do it with having heard their side, it's hard not to be shaken out of your faith, out of an incorrect faith when it's this shaky. Um, so we'll wrap it up here. Um, I, I'm happy to, I don't know what's happening next after this, but I'm happy to stick around if you've got questions and so on. Um, but um, that is, that is uh, uh, what, um, the, the last thing I left him with was verse in Galatians. And in Galatians, Paul writes this, he says, but even if we, he's talking about warning people about staying away from false ideas. He says this, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel that is the one other than the, the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. 
Unfortunately, that was Joseph Smith. He preached a different gospel. The Book of Mormon actually says this, another gospel, another testament of Jesus Christ. That is, the, that is what it is. It is. Thankfully, it shows us the real difference between our faith and a false one. Um, now, as you guys are leaving, I'm happy to hand out, oh boy, here we go. If anyone wants just that list of stuff, I got, I got it right here. You can come on up and grab one when you're done. Oh, one second. Um, and it's just, like I said, I kept this under my couch and because, I, again, I suck at memorizing this stuff, and it'll give you all that list of stuff. Sound good? Guys, thank you so much for coming. I'll put them up put them right here. You guys are welcome to grab the sheets. That was really good. Thank you. Appreciate it.